Lentz is a vascular surgeon from McGill University Health Center. He was the chair of the division for almost forever, I think, and just stepped down recently. Too long. Long time. Yeah. Uh, he's also a member of our aortic clinic, uh, which has cardiology, vascular surgery, and cardiac surgery, and also genetics, where we also follow all the type A and type B dissections. So interesting to hear what you have to say, Juan. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity here at the bitter end of this day. Um, basically, my talk, uh, there's not a lot of, I don't have a lot of data to present to you because there isn't a lot of data uh, regarding acute type B dissections in patients with inherited aortopathy. So if I was in a situation like the physician that was meeting Mr. Galley and his family, I probably would take a similar kind of step back, say if the resident called me in the middle of the night and said there's a patient here with a patient with Lois Ditz syndrome with an acute type B dissection, I probably, before I start rattling on the, the protocol and the algorithm, I probably stop, get on the, my computer and look up to see if I could find anything. So I'll give you a little bit of what I found, uh, in, what I would have found if I had that situation. So I have no disclosures. So a dissection, basically an intimal tear that propagates through the wall, creating a flap and uh, a re-entering uh, most often distally. If the dissection w creates a weakness in the aortic wall, obviously will form an aneurysm. So what we're talking about, an we're not be differentiate between acute and chronic dissections. We're talking about an acute dissection uh, basically within two weeks of presentation versus a subacute or a chronic dissection. We're not talking about type A dissections in this talk. We're talking about type B dissections, basically patients in which the tear occurs in the, usually in the descending thoracic aorta and involves the distal aorta. It might involve the arch, but it certainly doesn't involve the ascending aorta. That's the domain of a cardiac surgeon, not a vascular surgeon. I don't get called very much for that unless things are really going badly. So this, uh, the diagnosis is with CT scan or CT angiogram. And CT angiogram is very valuable because not only does it give you the diagnosis, it gives you the full extent of the aorta, and it's very important to image the entire aorta from the arch all the way down. So you see the true course of the dissection flap and what are, what, how is it impinging or involving all the different branches of the aorta. The, the key uh, for, for management of an acute dissection is medical management. That means having the patient in a monitor, monitor setting, blood pressure lowering, and pain control. We're looking for a blood pressure between 100 and 120 systolic, a heart rate of less than 60, usually with beta blockers and other medications. The goal is to prevent the propagation of the dissection, stabilize the aorta, if, if prevent an aneurysm formation. So from IRAD data, all comers, approximately 73% of acute type B aortic dissections can be managed so-called conservatively, that is, with medical therapy. In hospital mortality, approximately 10%, and uh, survival is pretty good. So what medical management doesn't mean just give the drugs and, and forget about the patient and discharge to the floor later. It means serial imaging of the aorta over the course of hours, days, weeks sometimes to evaluate what is the evolution of the dissected aorta. Um, we, we saw on top of medical management, there are various interventions that we do uh, to treat type B aorta, acute type B aortic dissections, and that is when we have th uh, these following. A aneurysm, uh, aortic rupture, aneurysm, malperfusion sy syndromes, or if medical therapy is failing and we have continued uncontrolled hypertension and re refractory pain. So rupture can easily be visualized on a CT scan, and it usually will come along with hemodynamic collapse. Aneurysm, again, on your serial imaging, you'll see an evolution in the diameter of the aortic. Yeah. There are various malperfusion syndromes. Mal malperfusion syndromes basically occurring because of the course of the dissection flap, either a, in a static way on the 
image on the, on the left where that dissection goes directly into the branch and it causes occlusion or ischemia or, or a dynamic um, syndrome in which the flap inter is intermittently or permanently pressed against the um, uh, branch due to a differential in pressure between the true and false lumen. So the dynamic obstruction can be an intermittent phenomena. Uh, it, can, it, it can vary with the heart rate. And sometimes it's not always evident on the CT scan, and it depends on the timing of the scan. The malperfusion, it can uh, involve pretty much any branch of the aorta, and it's highly variable between individual patients. So it really takes very careful, evalu uh, careful um, attention to details in evaluating these patients and their scans to appreciate whether the intercostal arteries, mesenteric arteries, renal arteries, et cetera, are involved because each of these organs can have ischemia and have a clinical uh, defect, and these patients are at the highest risk for mortality and morbidity after presenting with an acute type B dissection. So the indications for further intervention above medical management is when we have so-called complicated acute type B dissection, these, this list of uh, um, indications there. So the two, there are basically two options when you're dealing with an acute type B dissection. You either use an endovascular approach with a TVAR graft or you'd use an open approach with open um, uh, repair. So a TVAR, the goal of the TVAR is to cover the entry tear, reperfuse the true lumen, and exclude, basically try to exclude the false lumen. The TVAR, as was pointed out by previous speakers, you need, a, uh, you need proper anatomy to have a stent graft deploy, sit in the aorta, and do the job. It has to have, you have to have at least two centimeter, ideally, proximal and distal landing zones. You have to have a lack of excessive tortuosity, and the quality of the vessel has to be good. It can't be too ectotic or it's not going to work. So we, TVAR is very effective, however, in treating malperfusion compared to, I think, compared to open repair. And I think that's one of the reasons why the mortality uh, in our, the way we treat type B dissections has gone way down when, we, when there's been a more of an emphasis with TVAR. This patient presented with limb, bilateral limb, lower limb ex, uh, ischemia, and you can see on the, um, there is essentially occlusion of the infrarenal aorta. So he had, um, and we deployed a TVAR graft here in the proximal aorta, reperfused the true lumen. You see that the, the true lumen to false lumen ratio has increased. And this same patient, eight years later now, the aorta has essentially healed. So this patient obviously doesn't have a heritable aortic um, disease. These grafts we tend to deploy very proximally in the, the, the uh, descending thoracic aorta, sometimes overlapping the left subclavian. Uh, if the hematoma involves the arch, but it's clear that the tear is in the descending thoracic aorta, we can also uh, deploy the graft more and more proximally in the aorta uh, and perform various debranching procedures. And sometimes we can do a combination of an open arch procedure with a stented graft, distally, uh, thoraflex, or what have you, to um, uh, treat the, the patient. The, but that really depends on the anatomy and the extent of the dissection. So open surgery for an acute dissection essentially means a left thoracotomy. It need, means proximal distal clamping. It means opening the aorta, opening the dissection flap, sewing a synthetic graft or a prosthetic graft proximally and distally, and again, in, a, in an effort to redirect flow down the true lumen. These are, procedures are generally done with some kind of circulatory, or, uh, circulatory support, such as the atriofemoral bypass and uh, pretty standard uh, approach. Sometimes when the, the dissection is very high and involving the arch, like in this patient, we, had, we did this procedure under circulatory arrest. We did, actually did this through the left chest. Um, in a, that was a Marfan syndrome patient. So, if you look at data on survival in patients with type, acute type B dissection and you stratify them according to the intervention type, medical management means essentially uncomplicated type B dissection, TVAR versus surgical management. There was a huge difference in the outcome as far as survival. 
And that is the reason why in this day and age, this procedure, open repair, is actually rarely done in most centers because the, of the higher morbidity and mortality when compared with TVAR. Uh, it's more common, it's more commonly performed in chronic aneurysms from chronic type B dissections or, or type A dissections and in uh, patients who are inherited uh, aortopathy. So the basic algorithm is uncomplicated medical therapy, complicated medical therapy plus usually endovascular therapy and sometimes open surgery. So what do we do in a patient that has an inherited uh, aortic uh, disease, such as Marfan's, Loditz, uh, whatever? We don't, how do we decide what's the best option? I think the literature, even though it's very sparse, it's pretty clear what the main, uh, um, the main uh, treatment uh, algorithm should be. They're basically case reports, small series. There's some registries now, and most of the data, as was pointed up out by uh, earlier speakers, is on patients with Marfans. So this is a kind of uh, um, paper, again, if you're looking at 16 patients here in this series with, uh, you're, ty you're only looking at three patients with acute dissection, type B dissection. So even if you look at relatively, or, or a small series, you're looking at an even smaller series of patients presenting with an acute type B dissection. So it's very difficult to extrapolate from that information and try to figure, and, and get any useful information. Again, even in patients with inherited aortopathy, medical therapy is again the cornerstone of the treatment. And if you look at IRAD data, you can, you, we learn certain things. We learn that patients with inherited uh, aortopathies present with their type B dissections at a younger age, 40 years old versus 64. Fifty percent of those patients can be controlled by medical therapy versus 62 in the, other, in the larger group. And uh, open surgery is performed much more commonly in this group of patients, 28 percent, 20 versus 9.7 percent in the, in the greater series. Endovascular treatment, 19 percent versus 25 percent of cases in the, in the registry. So the other interesting uh, finding is that patients with uh, conditions like Marfan's dis uh, disease actually had a low perioperative mortality after open repair. And this is probably because they're younger and they have much less comorbidity than the average uh, run-of-the-mill type B aortic dissection patient. So information from registries, um, this re the GENTAC registry, uh, patients presenting with type B aortic dissection less than 50 years old, large group of mostly Marfan patients, and then a sporadic and familial uh, TBAD making up the bulk of this registry. Uh, patients with, um, again, lower incidence of hypertension in patients with Marfans, 28% versus 71% in the sporadic cases. Repair of the descending thoracic aorta is very common in patients with Marfan, 61 percent versus 48 percent in the sporadic cases at a mean of 34 a year. Thoracoabdominal aneurysm re repair also much more common in patients with Marfan syndrome who present with a type B dissection. No difference in survival, though. So is, is there a role for TVAR in inherited aortic uh, diseases? There is some role, I think, but if you, you, if you use it too much, I think you'll get, you, you'll get too much practice doing this operation, which is not what you want to have, meaning TVAR uh, explantation. So endovascular uh, thoracic aortic repair and confirmed or suspected genetically triggered thoracic aortic patients. Again, this, this, I think this uh, same slide was shown in an earlier presentation. 31 patients presenting with acute and chronic TBAD. Again, it's acute and chronic, so it's not only, we're not only looking at the acute presentations, again, a, a mix of syndrome, um, and uh, many of these patients were presumed syndrome, um, inherited disease, uh, just because of their young age. Uh, 
Um, again, TBAD treated with TVAR, 42% reintervention rate within a median of nine months, three retrograde type A dissections, 20, that basically meant 25% of the stent grafts that were implanted in the native aorta resulted in an acute type A dissection. Uh, 10 open thoracoabdominal aneurysms with stent uh, explantation. So what's a retrograde type A dissection post TVAR? Basically, it means that the, um, the, uh, you convert a bad problem into an even worse problem. So you have a, a rare complication of regular TVAR for TBAD, only 1.3 1 to 4% occurring up to 25% in these patients with more fragile aortas. What are the risk factors for retrograde type A dissection? We know that excessive graft oversizing is a risk factor, ballooning of the graft is a risk factor, and uh, sometimes failure to cover the actual true entry tear is, is, is obviously a risk factor. And then there's this, this other category, fragility of the aortic wall, and that applies to the the inheritable uh, or heritable um, aortic disease patients. So re reintervention again, 42% nine months, uh, compared to 12 to 14% with sporadic TVAR for TBAD. So TVAR for acute TBAD and Marfan's high risk of endoleak at proximal and distal fixation site dilation at fix uh, at the due to the dilation of the aorta at the fixation points, high risk of progressive aortic expansion, high risk of retrograde um, um, dissection, type A dissection. So this patient is patient 16-year-old when I first met him, initially diagnosed with Marfan syndrome, then after a uh, Im recent immigrant to Canada, but after further genetic testing, he was re-diagnosed as uh, Lloyd uh, Ditz syndrome. So the previous AVR aortic root replacement, we did an open thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm repair on this patient when he was 16. He presented again when he was, he, he had been followed actually very carefully and closely, no sign of problems. He presented with, uh, in shock with uh, an acute uh, type B dissection. Um, in extremis, so we took the patient to the operating room. We deployed a TVAR graft, stabilized the patient. He survived this hospitalization, spent approximately four, four and a half months in the hospital, eventually went home. We were discussing whether we were gonna proceed and now replace his aortic arch, but then he presented again a couple of months later with chest pain and acute dilation of his ascending aorta. So within six months, his ascending aorta went from this to this, and you can see clearly there's a flap consistent with a type A dissection. This patient underwent a arch repair uh, with the distal anastomosis into the TVAR graft and uh, following him still now at 29 years old. So there is a role, it, it saved his life, but it clearly was not the, the solution, long-term solution. From, the, uh, from this registry in uh, Norway, we're looking at 57 cardiovascular operations and 35 patients. Um, Nine, um, nine post-dissection aneurysms, this will be our, eight of these, however, are post-type A dissections. Only one case is, is really TBAD. So again, even when you have a registry of fairly large patients, a uh, uh, fairly large number of patients with a very rare disease, if you really want to drill it down and find out what, is the, what do you do in TBAD, you have a hard time finding useful information. Another patient we treated recently, 24 years old, uh, previous MVR in 2006, spinal fusions, aortic root repair, ascending aortic repair, open type B dissection in June 2018, had to have a redo because of a distal pseudoaneurysm. So he had already had two um, left thoracotomies. Um, we wanted to, and he had then had progressive dilatation over a six month period of his dis distal descending thoracic aorta from 3.8 to 4.5 centimeters. So we wanted to avoid another thoracotomy. We didn't necessarily want to use a TVAR graft, so we did a similar procedure that was shown 
here we perform first, uh, this is my diagram of my proce the procedure. We did an aorto to bi-iliac bifurcated graft. We did bilateral bifurcated grafts to the four viscera, ligated the proximal renals, SMA and celiac, uh, and then we deployed a T-var graft from the old descending thoracic aortic uh, prosthesis down to our new prosthesis and um, looks like a good picture. We don't have very much follow-up on this patient so far. So what are good indications for T-VAR in uh, aortic her her yeah, inherited aortopathy with type B dissections? I think basically good indications are when you can land grafts and prosthetic material. You can, if you have a patient with prohibitive risk or if you have a life-saving intervention, but with rec and you recognize that this is just a bridge to a more definitive repair. Again, technical issues in these patients, yeah, they have high proximal and, dis um, and distal endoleaks, so you really have to, you can't use this if there's any ectasia in the proximal aorta. You have to avoid ballooning the graft. Um, instead of ballooning the graft, if there's a proximal endoleak acutely, we would favor just putting a distal extension because of the risk of ballooning and the subsequent risk of type A dissection. Um, again, ideally proximal and distal fixation in the graft. Some issues about T-VAR in these patients. We Normally we do all of our T-VARs with percutaneous access, but in these patients I, I don't do that. We do open access and repair the artery under direct vision uh, with or without any kind of reinforcement. Um, they obviously will require very strict post-operative imaging and follow-up. Um, so basically, in, in outside of Marfan's, we really don't have very good information about um, the outcome of TVAR. Uh, again, uh, and I think open surgery is the gold standard. Just one other case, 50-year-old male presented in extremis uh, dissection, um, 4.5 centimeter proximal aortic diameter dilation, but also uh, malperfusion syndrome with bowel ischemia. So we put a T-VAR in him quickly, um, stabilized him. He was out of the hospital, saw him in, the f saw him in my first follow-up, and had a very remarkable uh, dilatation of the distal aorta. So these patients, they don't always come in the door in a, an emergency situation with a label on them saying, I have a heritable, inherited aortopathy. So you have to you have to be aware of that, and anybody who falls off the, out of the, the norm, say this patient is just on the border of young for this kind of problem. In this patient, we eventually um, brought him to the operating room electively, and we did an open thoracoabdominal repair down to the aortic bifurcation with four visceral branches. Uh, because he had a T-VAR graft and a large aneurysm of seven centimeters of the proximal aorta, we use the technique that has been described here where we sewed the proximal graft into the T-VAR graft incorporating the wall of the aorta and that we did this under circulatory arrest to avoid clamping the T-VAR graft and the, uh, the uh, aortic aneurysm. So you have to suspect heritable disease in these patients who, who are young, who have concomitant aneurysms elsewhere in the aorta. Um, that ha certainly if they have clinical extravascular st stigmata. If they present with an acute dissection and they are normal, have basically no history of any hypertension, you should, have, you should be suspicious. Uh, you should consider open repair, I think, as a treatment of choice if they're hemodynamically stable and if it's possible. TVAR, if very unstable, or particularly if they have a malperfusion syndrome. Um, so in summary, there's some data, but it's mostly for Marfan. We have no, little to no data on the other syndromes. Medical therapy is the cornerstone of treatment. Um, opera, open repair is the treatment of choice. Uh, TVAR, high risk, um, only in special cases, and have a high index of suspicion in patients that don't fit the norm. And, and um, I think that's about it. I think you've probably had enough.